Fulbrighters and friends, the 2021 J. William Fulbright Prize Laureate, Bob. Wow. Gosh. That's incredible. You send flowers, you get cold being tall. Amazing. Thank you, God almighty. Oh, man. Um, thank you. Thanks for that. Madam Director General of the WTO, introducing Monsieur Director General of the WTF. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> No, <laughs> Ngozi and Conjuela, I, I, I love you. And uh, yeah, we first got to know each other on the debt, on the drop the debt trail. And you were finance minister of Nigeria. What you failed to mention, what was so extraordinary was that as finance minister, um, during the oil boom, yeah, in, in Nigeria, the finance minister used the proceeds, large swathes of the proceeds of the oil boom to buy back the debt, creating a model and putting priority on that debt forgiveness. But she put her money where her mouth was. She's extraordinary. She's one of us. We like to think she's one of us who became one of them. <laughs> Both sides of the barricades sort of thing. She's always one of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's my boss, Gail Smith. <laughs> Gail Force Smith. Uh, a few days ago, in a video, the kind of video you've all seen, President Zelensky called on all of us musicians, athletes, businessmen, politicians, everybody really to stand up for Ukraine. So as a musician, <clears throat> let me not apologize from where I come from. I come from noise and the intent to find some signal in that noise. I come from informality, from occasional dishevelment. I come from rock and roll. I come from rock and roll and pop lyrics that sound like they are throwaway lines, and they are, but they mean so much. I was thinking about the Beatles, I saw her standing there. It's about as great a song lyric as I've ever heard. It does not describe itself as poetry. It's better. It's adolescent and it's transcendent. It's instant and it's eternal. It's fun, but not funny. Well, the funny's okay. I like. Short People <laughs> by Randy Newman. I like some limericks too. There was a rock singer called Bono. You, know, you get it. Stereo, mono, oh no, you know, come on. I like agitprop as well as political satire. Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Bob Dylan, the times, they are changing. But I saw her standing there. Still my favorite. I heard it when I was a kid. I, I, it just trapped my imagination. Uh, I wondered, who was it who inspired the song? I, who was the her in the song? Back then, it might have been, you know, the girl next door. Earlier times, I might have thought of it as my mother. But now I realize who Paul McCartney was singing to. It was freedom. His and the ours. You see, rock and roll, if it's anything, it's the sound of liberation. Political, spiritual, sexual, it's liberation. It's, yes, <clears throat> it's the howl, the crash bang wallop, you know, the cry of a soul setting itself on fire. I, I, I think rock and roll is the sound of liberation. And liberation is at the core of, of, of who I am, not just as a singer, but as a European, Mr. Ambassador. Um, and it's also, I imagine, on this very salubrious evening, I'm also sure it's at the core of who you are, 
as Americans. You might swap out the word freedom for the word liberation. I think we're all agreed on the concept. And we're all agreed that it's not just under siege in Ukraine, now is it? So in fact, when we hear President Zelensky speaking, or when you look at the humbling heroism on the people of Kiev or Lviv or Mariupol, there's a part of me <clears throat> that feels they're, they're more European than me. Is there not a part of you that feels they are more American than you? Yeah. Why? Because they are actually living, actually dying for the ideal that is freedom. Yeah. They're fighting for our freedom too. <clears throat> now, we haven't been asked to face that test yet. I should be thankful for that. Not embarrassed by it, but somehow I'm both. Maybe you are too. There's, there's a nagging thought that maybe we've fallen asleep in the comfort of our freedom, or at least we're, we're waking up rough, you know, our eyes are bleary, we're a little confused. The question that jolted us awake, what will we do for freedom in Ukraine, gives way, the more we think about it, to another more uncomfortable question. How long might our own freedom last? It's the old joke, isn't it? How do you swallow an elephant one bite at a time? Or maybe a better line is, is, is an Ernest Hemingway who said, how do you go bankrupt gradually, then suddenly? You see, for me, Ukraine is 1962, 1948, 1939, all rolled up together. The jeopardy of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the geopolitical uh, significance of the Berlin airlift, the moral clarity of the outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, most people my age, um, most people my age uh, grew up thinking the world was becoming uh, more and more free. This is especially after the Berlin Wall came down. Revolutions waged in velvet. There were exceptions, but it was as if there was a kind of moral evolution <coughs> at work. It was almost like you'd have to stand in the way of freedom to stop its onward march. Though there's no evidence over five or six millennia to back up this idea, I think my generation and I believe that. But by the time I, I turned 60, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much. Um, well, by the time I turned 60, wait till I tell you. Uh, by the time I turned 60, uh, it felt to a lot of my friends like freedom was, was, was no longer gathering pace, was it? In fact, it felt like it was reversing course, retreating down some dodgy cul-de-sac. After January 6th in this city, I sensed a mood of grief. Some spoke of the American dream dying on the steps of the Capitol that chilling day. But it wasn't the American dream that was dying. The American dream is alive. It was a death of a generation's innocence. And from my point of view, I was okay with that. A kind of innocence that saw progress as inevitable. Naivete is another word for, for this innocence. And I'm not sorry that we've lost it. In the one campaign, we say, don't agonize, organize. <laughs> now, <clears throat> on my 60th birthday, I also made a list of 60 songs that all changed me in some way. 60 songs that saved my life is what I call the list. It's one by Bob Marley, one by The Clash, one by Public Enemy, one by Billie Eilish. There's another song that should be on the list. America. America is a song to me. I caught the, the melody line early when my life needed saving. You know, teenager in Dublin, America's song came on the radio like a surge of static electricity. Knocked me out of my bed. Knocked me out of my head. You know, the song sounded like Elvis, sounded like Bob Dylan. 
Sounded like Aretha Franklin. Sounded like Johnny Cash, Joey Ramone, you know? Sounded like Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. Sounded like King. Bob Dylan sounded like the Declaration of Independence with a harmonica and guitar, you know? Um, I grew up in a Dublin quiet suburbia. The street I grew up was really quite lovely, but it has to be said, uh, Mr. Buster, Ireland in the 70s was a bit grim. Okay? All right. Country was on the verge of civil war, neighbor against neighbor, streets, household at war. You know all this. You've seen Belfast. I love the picture. But Ireland back there was an insular place. But it wasn't insulated because, well, we looked to you. We looked to America. We had a big crush on you all. <laughs> and we saw a, a country with its own long-running arguments, its own injustices. We knew this promised land wasn't always keeping to that promise. We knew America wasn't living up to all its ideals. But the fact is, America had ideals. We knew that because you wrote them down. You cited them. You held yourself account on them. They shaped the struggle for civil rights movements, women's rights, and gay rights. They're still shaping you today. And uh, I don't know how, but early on, I, I really think I felt or seemed to know that America wasn't just a country, that it was an idea, if not yet a fact. Even when it got messy, even when it got wild. America isn't classical music. America's punk rock. <laughs> America's hip hop. I had a sense, you know, I had a sense of America wrestling with itself. You were caught in the act of becoming, becoming yourself, becoming your better self. William, William Fulbright, how are you? <laughs> um, you know, He's William to me. Uh, Bill Fulbright talked about the magnetism of freedom, though he was selective about it. Even if he missed the full expression of it, in Ireland we felt its pull, and I have ever since. I love this song called America. I love it. I love it. Can you still hold that tune? I ask you as both fanboy and critic, yes, you can, of course you can. And might you let a rock star, an Irish rock star of medium height, remind you how good it is. It's a great fucking tune. <clears throat> this tune called America. You put a man on the moon, now you're gonna put a woman on the moon and the first person of color. Come on. Love this tune. Yeah, yeah, something has shifted. Yes, freedom is under attack from the outside, but also from the inside. You know who you are. <laughs> if we're honest, it's easier to identify when the threat is rolling in on tanks and blowing up hospitals. In Ukraine, freedom isn't the line in a song. Freedom's on the line. It's life or death. Shopkeepers making Molotov cocktails, ballet dancers wearing combat gear. Freedom in Ukraine means people don't want to take up, people who don't want to take up arms, taking up arms. Strangely, freedom in Ireland has meant people laying them down. To end the fighting in Ireland, to achieve the peace, it's just worth remembering on a night like this, it took unusual acts of courage. And what I mean by that is not I actually mean the not the usual acts of courage. True heroics, but of a much less grand kind. And yes, it, 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 it took America uh, to change the geometry of the peace talks. That's actually what won the peace on the island of, of Ireland. It was discussion, you know, lots of it, negotiation. And what I was calling today, and I was thinking about it, a kind of sedated stamina. That's what won the day in Ireland. But who am I telling? You know, some of you in this room live this 
kind of work every day. You might call it the daily toil of democracy. This is a room full of toilets. And you know what I'm talking about. The dog-eared documents, the conference tables with the plates of stale sandwiches, the deli trails, you know, the deli trays with the curls of cheese. Oh, you missed that when you no. The headaches from the fluorescent lights, the late nights missing your families at home. That's the real heroism. That's what peace looks like, actually. That kind of daily toil. People like you, public servants. I'm so spoiled to be in this, to be given this war tonight in a room full of people who actually deserve it, who've given your lives, really given your lives into public service. It's incredible. All across the aisle in the administration. In Ireland and elsewhere, we learn the taste of victories that don't eat equal total victory, total defeat on the other side. Victories measured by a parity of pain. Well, that daily toil has rarely had higher stakes than it is now. We're not yet being asked to put our lives on the line yet, but freedom, says the cliche, isn't free. In fact, it's really, really expensive. I've just been on the hill with the One campaign, harassing my friends to get vaccines into the arms of people who can't get to them. You know who you are. Great people in the house. I can't name you because it could affect the outcome. <laughs> it's costly freedom. But everyone I met here in the capital understands that right now we need to show the world what freedom looks like and demonstrate what we can do with it. Putin thinks democracy is done. He's done. He, he's not just a tyrant. He's like a bad Bond villain. <laughs> Wouldn't even give him the status. But reinvention? Nah, he won't do that. He is what he is. Reinvention is a peculiarly American trait. Redemption. Isn't that an American song? So go tell the bullies in the pulpit, the American song has never been a solo. It's symphonic, actually. But there are melodies missing. They've been missing from the start. And there are performers now on the stage who were previously thrown off, who were excluded. So the song isn't the same one that we thought we knew. It turns out the song is still to be written, the American song. It might be, America might be, the greatest song the world has never heard, yet. Think about that. America might be the greatest song the world has yet to hear. It's a wild thought. It's an exciting thought that after 246 years of this struggle for freedom, after 246 years of inching and crawling towards freedom, sometimes on your belly, sometimes on your knees, sometimes marching, sometimes striding, this might be the moment you let freedom ring. Or in my case, let freedom sing. Oh, God, wait for this. After, after the president, I'm the second most likely person in this town to quote Seamus Heaney. <laughs> so I didn't want to let the opportunity pass. <laughs> in a poem called Casualty, uh, it, it, you know, Heaney writes about a, uh, a friend of his father's um, actually, his father-in-law's pub in Arbo, um, and a friend who got killed after a bloody Sunday. And he has this phrase where he says, as a kind of consolation, he says, I tasted freedom with him. And this kind of stuck with me. Because here in this city, and thank you for letting me in your city, I never leave. But here in Washington, I've tasted freedom with so many of you. I really have. Tony Fauci, figuring this stuff out. It's incredible. But I just want to point straight to this man over here, sitting with us tonight, the lion of the Senate, Senator Leahy.
a lion of the city, 48 years of service, about to retire, but still roaring. Are you not? <clears throat> He's going to get his camera out now. If you live in this town and you haven't been photographed by Pat Leahy, you should feel left out. <laughs> but this is an occasion worth recording. Pat is 83 years old, two nights. <laughs> Marissa. Come on. Happy birthday, Senator. I won't ask you to roar for us or at me. I've enjoyed both. <laughs> but I will say this about you. You do not see this country as a mouse. Just as you did as a boy in Vermont, just as I did as a boy in Dublin, all around the world, you felt that thing that Fulbright talked about, the magnetism of freedom, the pull. Did anyone see the news today, by the way? While tens of millions stand to fight for freedom in Ukraine, four million people, it's now four million people are fleeing for their lives, mostly women and children. It's a population the size of Ireland, fleeing for freedom, an exodus of biblical proportions. Americans understand exodus. It's what led many of you here, generations before you, or maybe your own, fleeing oppression, fleeing pogroms and persecution, fleeing famine. Exodus, movement of the people, exodus. Do any of you know Bob Marley's song, Exodus? Yeah. Bob Marley's like the Beatles to so many struggling nations. Wherever you go, you'll find Bob Marley. But the thing about Exodus is it's not just a song of departure. It's a song of arrival. Not just a place, but a state of being, a state of grace, redemption. Redemption is an American song. It's also an economic term, I might add. As the Irish, as the Africans, as the Jews have all sung themselves the American song, as Ukrainians are singing it now, I will tonight sing a redemption song for you, a hymn to close the evening, a song of freedom, the last song on Bob Marley's last album. Just give me a moment. I know this, but just in case I didn't. <laughs> okay. Oh, pirates, yes, they rob I. Sold I to the merchant ships. Minutes after, they took I from the bottomless pit. But my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We forward in this generation triumphantly. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Because all I've ever done Redemption song, all I ever had. Redemption songs, redemption songs, redemption songs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a question, it's an invitation, it's a provocation. Thank you so much.